Word of Faith Netcast is on the air. Well, praise God, this is Dr. Bill Bailey, and this is the Word of Faith Netcast. I'm glad you could join us for this week's netcast. We're going to be getting in some good things this week, and I trust you are ready to get into the Word of God. Before we do, though, i got a couple of things I'd like to mention to you. We have the opportunity. I know this netcast goes all over the world. It literally is being listened to by people throughout the world, and I appreciate that, and I, uh, I thank you for tuning in and, and listening and viewing the netcast. But I want to speak today very specifically to those of us in this local area where I live, and that's in North Carolina, the state of North Carolina in the United States of America. I encourage everyone that is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Word of God here in North Carolina to vote this coming May the 8th May the 8th, it's not very far away, we have an opportunity to do something that I believe will be a blessing to this state. Many other states in the South have passed constitutional amendments defining marriage, the word marriage, as a union between a man and a woman. Now that is the biblical definition of marriage. You personally may feel like, well, if people of the same sex want to get married, there's no skin off my nose. That's fine. That's your personal opinion. That may be your political opinion. I'm talking what the Bible says. Now, as Christians, we're supposed to operate based on the Word of God. We're supposed to believe based on the Word of God. And there is no question but that the biblical definition of marriage is between a man and a woman. We have no example in the Bible of a man and a man and a woman and a woman being engaged in marriage. Now there's a lot of discussion about men and men and women and women. And I'd encourage you to read the book of Romans. See a lot of people say, oh, it's just Old Testament. Go to the book of Romans, that's in the New Testament, chapter 1, and see what Romans chapter 1 has to say about anything other than men and women being married and having sexual relations. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole long diatribe or a whole long spiel on that particular subject. What I am saying is, that we as believers here in North Carolina have the opportunity to to stand up and to take a stand for marriage being defined in the biblical fashion between a man and a woman. I encourage you to do that. That is not making any kind of value judgments on people, on their value, their worth, whatever, That's not what it's about. We're talking about the definition of a word. And you've listened to this netcast, perhaps, before. This may be your first time. I don't know. But if you have listened before, you know that words are important. God's word is important. Words that we speak out of our mouth are important. They mean things. I've even heard secular uh, pundits make statements like, words mean things. And this politically correct generation that we live in, sadly, wants to redefine words on a constant basis so that you're never quite sure what it is you're talking about when you talk about certain things. And again, I'm not going to get into a long discussion. It is not my purpose to be political. I am certainly not being partisan. This is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is a Bible issue. The Bible definition of the word marriage is between one man and one woman. And that is the opportunity we have here in the state of North Carolina on May 8th to vote and to take a stand 
for biblical marriage. So I'm encouraging you strongly to take a stand for the Word of God. Vote not your opinion, not your desire, not your I wish it was this way. None of that, but simply vote what the Bible says. And as a matter of fact, if you'll vote what the Bible and the Holy Ghost are speaking to you about, you'll get a whole lot better representation in various governmental offices if you just do that. Amen? Again, not partisan, not Republican, not Democrat, not telling you how to vote for anybody. That's not the purpose. I'm encouraging you to vote the Bible on May 8th on this constitutional amendment. All right? Really, this is a serious thing, and I think we should take it seriously. As Christians, very often we'll complain and we'll moan and we'll groan and we'll say, oh, the world is going, you know, down the tubes and all this kind of stuff. Well, now's your chance to stand up for the Word of God and stand up for scriptural uh, definitions and scriptural stands and do it in faith boldly. There's nothing wrong with boldly doing what the Word of God says and standing up for it. Amen? So I just wanted you to encourage you to do that. Praise God. All right. I've got my, <laughs> my Bible here on uh, Cadre Bible. I'll put that here up on the screen, Cadre Bible. It is the Bible that I use on my Android tablets. Uh, I use eSword, e-sword.net. I'll put that up here for my uh, personal computers. But as far as my tablets like this and my, my phone, I have a, uh, uh, what do I do with it? Here it is. <laughs> it's my Android phone. I have Cadre Bible on that as well, and I encourage you to check it out. It's an excellent, excellent Bible. What I want to do today is I want to start uh, a new study, and this study is so important. It's critical to you as a believer. It has to do with something that I just said a minute ago, and that is the importance of words. But it's not specifically, this study, we're not specifically talking about words per se. We're talking about a specific area of confession. When you speak out of your mouth, that's called confession. Now you may say, well, yeah, but Dr. Bill, I was raised believing that confession meant confession of sin. Well, confession of sin is confession, but I'm talking about words that you speak out of your mouth day in, day out, about yourself, about other things. That's your confession. Those are words that come out of your mouth. And we know from our past studies that James, the book of James, chapter 3, says that if you can control your tongue, the words that come out of your mouth, you are a perfect man. Now the word perfect there, you know, a lot of people get all bent out of shape about that. Well, I can't be perfect. Well, in this life, I, you know, I might tend to agree with you that we can't be perfect, but we can certainly be mature. And that is what that word means, to be mature. So we need to grow up spiritually. Amen. We need to grow up in Christ. We need to grow up in the Word of God. No longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. All right? So in order to do that, we need to, according to James chapter 3 that we just made reference to, we need to get a hold of our words. If you can control your words, you are a mature believer. Amen? And the words of our tongue, of our mouth, are like the rudder of a ship, James chapter 3 says. It's a very small part of the ship, but it turns the whole ship. And that big old ship, that if you can imagine an ocean liner, it doesn't turn on a dime. You know what I mean by that? It doesn't turn instantly. It's a slow, gradual turn. Matter of fact, uh, in, in naval terminology, they talk about coming about. And they talk about that in terms of, uh, of other large vessels to come about. In other words, it's a gradual change. Well, that's what happens with your tongue. You begin to say things out of your mouth, and it begins to affect your life. Matter of fact, it's affecting your life every single day. But it changes the direction of your life. It changes the direction of where you're headed in life. 
So you start making confessions. That's what we're talking about here, speaking words. Confessions concerning yourself. And if you're constantly saying things like, well, I can't do that. I'm not capable of this. I'm not capable of that. Well, you're speaking your future. You're speaking who you will be in the future. So, if I were to start confessing with my mouth, I am fully capable. I can understand these things. I have a sharp mind. I'm quick to understand. It's not going to change the next day immediately, but the ship will begin to change direction. You see what I'm saying? you will begin to come in line with those confessions that you're making. Now, here's the point that I want to get into in this particular study. It's not enough to just confess good things. Did you get that? It's not enough just to confess good things. You can confess good things all day long, and there's a benefit in that. Don't get me wrong. There's a benefit in it, but it's not a spiritual, supernatural benefit. It will encourage you to speak good things outside of the Word of God. It will strengthen you to a certain extent in your attitude and in your perceptions and in your uh, demeanor in life. And that's great. Nothing wrong with that. You know, a lot of people talk about, I'm going to make my daily affirmations. I'm going to say things that are positive. I'm going to say that I'm smart and I can do what I'm supposed to be able to do and blah, blah, blah. They make all these good confessions. Well, that's fine, but they're not based directly on Scripture. You see what I'm saying? So what you want to do is you want to go to the Bible and you want to find out what the Bible says about you. Now, for instance, I was talking about people who make a confession concerning their mental capabilities. They may say something like, I'm intelligent. Well, that's fine. Certainly better than saying I'm dumb. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But if I go to the Scripture and the Scripture tells me, you have the mind of Christ... Well, now when I start to confess, I have the mind of Christ. I have understanding that comes through the Holy Spirit. I can know all things. See, now I'm basing a confession on the Word of God, not just on making a good confession. Do you see the difference there? The difference is actually quite uh, startling in terms of its effects. Because in the natural world, if you start making confessions, the only thing you're going to be doing is affirming positive things to yourself. And as I said, there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. That's fine. There's even some benefit in that. Again, nothing wrong with it. But it's not empowered by the Holy Ghost. It's not empowered by the Word of God. The Word of God, listen closely to this, the Word of God is the power of God. The Bible says that God sustains and maintains everything by the Word of His power. Amen? So His Word is His power. That's where the anointing connects with words and causes those words to have much more authority and much more power than if you were to just make good confessions by just making good confessions. Okay? Again, nothing wrong with making good confessions. But if you make Bible confessions, then it's empowered by the Holy Ghost. Then it's empowered by the anointing. That's a whole nother realm. It's a whole nother place to be. Amen? All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. I've got it here in my uh, cadre Bible that I was talking about earlier. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Well, who's that great high priest that's passed into the heavens? Well, it goes on to say, Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus is our high priest. Okay, 
but he's the high priest of what? Let us hold fast our profession. He is the high priest of our profession. Now the word profession here is also translated confession. In any case, it's talking about words. And more specifically, this word profession is the Greek word homo logio. Homo logio. Now if we take that word and break it apart, homo means the same in Greek. Logio comes from logos, which we know is the written word. So we have same words. Same written words. So what do we have? We have someone, Jesus, who is the high priest of our speaking the same written words. Ooh, hallelujah. Did you get that? Jesus is the high priest of our speaking the same written words. In other words, when we come into agreement with God, God had his word written down for us. We have it in the form of the Bible. Whether it's electronically here on a tablet like this, or whether it's physically paper like the books behind me here in the bookshelf, either way, it's words written on paper. The Word of God talks about the Holy Scriptures. Those are words written on paper. Now, in, the, in Pete, uh, Peter said, I think it's 2 Peter, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm thinking it's 2 Peter. Matter of fact, I'll just go look for it here because we got some time. I like to take the time to make sure that I'm giving you the right scriptures anyway, and since I hadn't planned to go to that scripture, I didn't have it ready. But we'll go take a look at it. Uh, let's see. The way this is laid out makes it a little difficult to find. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm still getting used to using the... Uh, there we go. Still getting used to using the interface here on Cadre Bible. But let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. And let's see if that's where we're... where I'm thinking about. Yeah, here we go. 2 Peter chapter 1. thought it was 2 Peter, but I wanted to be sure. Chapter 1, let's look in verse... Uh, 17. For he received from God, talking about Jesus, Peter here is talking about the experience that they had of seeing Jesus transfigured on the mount. When he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Who can you imagine being on the mountain that day? And hearing God speak to Jesus, his son, and say, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Wow. Now Peter goes on to say here, And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. In other words, they heard the voice coming from heaven. Now, you might say to yourself, Man, if I could hear the actual, literal voice of God coming from heaven, oh my goodness, that would just... I, my life would never be the same. Well, now hold on here. <laughs> Let's go back to what he was saying here. Uh, verse 18. And this voice, the voice of God, which came from heaven, we heard... When we were with him in the holy mount, but, look what he says next in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Wow, think about that. Hearing God's audible voice, but he says, no, we've got a more sure word. Well, what's that word? Where until you do well that you take heed is unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture... See the word Scripture here. Now if I look up the word Scripture in uh, the Greek, it is graphe in the Greek, and it means a document, i.e. the Holy Writ, or its contents, Scripture. So if it's a document, that means it's actually the Bible. It's not some spiritualized, you know, uh, 
Holy Spirit spoken but not ever written down, you know, any of that kind of stuff. This is the actual Holy Writ, the Bible he's talking about. None of that is of any private interpretation. Now I'm going to look up the Greek here on private. It is ideos, meaning pertaining to one's self by implication to be private or of simply of yourself. In other words, alone or of yourself. And then interpretation is the Greek word epilipsis, epilosis, epilosis, <laughs> got to spell it out, which means explanation, application, or interpretation. Now I'm going to go back and read that in the verse, and I want you to think about it. The Bible, the Holy Scripture, is not open to a personal, private interpretation, explanation, application, or interpretation. Woo! In other words, you can't just decide, well, that's what I believe. That's what my church teaches. I don't care what your Bible says. No, the Bible is the whole point, literally. It is the authority of God. Remember, everything's held, held up by the word of his power. <laughs> and it's not open to private interpretation. And Peter says, it's a more sure word than if you heard God's voice with your own ears on the side of your head. I'm not talking about some internal spiritual revelation. I'm talking about hearing God. The Word of God's more sure because it is forever settled in heaven. Now here's the thing, and that by the way is Psalm 119, God's Word is forever settled in heaven. All right, if Jesus is the high priest of us speaking the same thing that is written in the Logos, the written Word, the Holy Writ, as that definition said, then the Bible has to be preeminent and predominant in everything we do. Everything we say, everything that applies to us in any form or fashion, the Bible is our authority. Oh, but Dr. Bill, what about spiritual revelation from the Holy Ghost? Well, I'm all for spiritual revelation from the Holy Ghost, and I've had a few of those myself. But you know what? Spiritual revelation from the Holy Ghost always takes you to the Word of God, the written Word, and it always is in line with the Word of God, the written Word. The Holy Ghost will not reveal something to you separate from the Word of God. He will not reveal something to you different from the Word of God or contrary to the Word of God. Anything that you've got is a revelation that does not agree with the written Word of God is devils. Was that strong enough for you? <laughs> Devils. In other words, doctrines of devils. We're literally dealing with doctrines of devils in this day and age. Because there are a great many revelations that people are getting that are outside of the Bible, outside of the Word of God. And let me tell you, brother and sister, that's just wrong. That will take you off in a direction you do not want to go. So what I'm telling you here is, and this, this goes in line with what we said at the beginning of the, of the program here, about sticking to the authority of the Word and what the Word defines. So for instance, when it comes to May 8th in, in North Carolina, when we get to vote for a biblical definition of marriage, we're taking a stand on the Word of God. Well, that's what we need to do day in, day out, Everything we are involved in, we ought to be taking a stand for the Word of God. We ought to be taking a stand for the authority of God's Word. And when we hear doctrines that are contrary to the Word of God, then we need to say, whoa, hold on. You done, you done gone too far for me <laughs> when you're out beyond the Bible. You know, that's what happened to Brother Kenneth Hagin. He had somebody say, I got this great revelation. And Brother Hagin said, well, show me this from the Scripture. And the guy said, oh, I'm out beyond that thing. 
Brother Hagin said, well, then you're out beyond me. <laughs> I don't want to hear anything about it because I want to know only what the Word of God says. There's safety there, folks. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you, you need to stay with the Word of God. All right, we're just about out of time. Let me encourage you to write me here at Word of Faith Ministries. Our address is Word of Faith Ministries, P.O. Box 5213-5213, High Point, North Carolina, the zip code 27262. You can also write me at my email address. I encourage you to do that. It's a lot faster. And you can write to Dr. Bill, D-R-B-I-L-L, at W-O-F-M. Dot org. Now that really uh, is also a, a good reminder to go to our website. Our website is WOFM, which stands for Word of Faith Ministries, dot org, make, because it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, and I'd encourage you to go to WOFM.org. We've just revamped the website. There's a lot of good information there. There's uh, articles that are available there uh, that I've written throughout the years. And they're biblically sound, biblically based articles that will feed your faith and starve your doubts. Praise the Lord. We also have all of our radio programs on WFR.org that have aired. Those are on the website. Teaching on the website. Uh, audio, video, all kinds of resources are available there. So I encourage you to go right here. I'll put it up on the screen. www.wofm. Dot .org Join us next time remember until then to fulfill the word of God The Word of Faith netcast is brought to you by Word of Faith Ministries and our partners around the world